Welcome again, good afternoon or good morning, depending on your time zone, and a warm welcome to the many Africa Center alumni who have joined us today for this webinar on women, peace, and security in Africa. My name is Shannon Smith. I am the Director of Engagement and a Professor of Practice at the Africa Center, and I will be moderating this discussion. Thank you so much for joining us. You represent 27 different countries, many different um, professions, some of you are military, some civilian, some are men, some are women. In short, you represent the security sector writ large. We are very pleased you are here to join us for the first of what will be a series of webinars on the role of women and the issue of gender more broadly in advancing security. Again, for interpretation, there is a button uh, on your screen. You can choose your language of choice. It is now my pleasure to pass the baton to our director, Ms. Kate Almquist Knott, to launch our conversation. Uh, good day, distinguished colleagues, friends, and alumni of the Africa Center. Uh, it is my great pleasure to greet you today uh, and to welcome to our webinar on women, peace, and security. Where does policy and practice stand in Africa? The Africa Center for Strategic Studies, as many of you know, is an academic institution of the Department of Defense. We are located at the National Defense University in Washington, DC, and we serve as a forum for research, academic programs, and the exchange of ideas you know, with the aim of enhancing citizen security by strengthening institutions and uh, uh, increasing their effectiveness and accountability. Uh, we seek to expand understanding, uh, to uh, provide uh, uh, trusted spaces for dialogue, uh, such as we'll have today, uh, to deepen our relationships with each other, and to catalyze uh, strategic solutions. So we look forward to this conversation, and I thank our very eminent panel, Ambassador Fatima Mohammed, uh, General Bjorn Jop, Dr. Yolande Bua, for joining us and leading us in our conversation. I will now turn it back to our moderator, Dr. Shannon Smith. Thank you all. Thank you, Kate, and again, welcome. I would like to thank our distinguished panelists who are joining us today. As Kate said, Her Excellency Ambassador Fatima Kiari Mohammed, General Biram Diop, and Dr. Yolande Buka. As a reminder, for interpretation, you can select English, French, or Portuguese under the interpretation button. To ask a question of one of our speakers, or if you have a technical problem, you can write your question in the chat function. This is the first in a series of virtual discussions that the Africa Center will offer that analyze the role of gender in promoting security and peace. I'm pleased to be leading this series with my colleague, Dr. Catherine Kelly. Today, we are joined by a very distinguished panel, and their full biographies are available on our website, but I will give you an abridged version, which will not do justice to their illustrious careers. Ambassador Fatima Mohammed is the permanent observer of the African Union to the United Nations. In addition to representational functions, her mandate includes developing and maintaining constructive and productive institutional relationships between the African Union and the United Nations institutions, supporting and coordinating the activities of the African group at the United Nations, as well as ensuring the effective monitoring, implementation, and promotion of African Union decisions within the Africa group in multilateral negotiations. Prior to appointment, she was a senior advisor to the ECOWAS Commission. Her career spans more than two decades with a focus on peace, security, socioeconomic development, regional integration, organizational development, and project management in the public and private sector. She has an extensive academic pedigree, which you can see on our website, and is an Africa Center uh, alumna and esteemed partner of us and an Eisenhower Fellow. Lieutenant General Biram Diop, as we translated in our American system at any rate, is a chief of defense uh, staff of the Senegalese Armed Forces. Prior to his appointment as chief of defense staff, he served as the national security advisor to the president of Senegal. General Diop also served previously as the chief of staff and a deputy chief of staff of the Senegalese Air Force. And as a pilot, he's accumulated a total of 7,000 flying hours. General Diop is a scholar and practitioner with an long academic pedigree of his own, and an esteemed partner of the Africa Center. He was a fellow at the National Endowment for Democracy in the Woodrow Wilson Center, where he conducted research 
on African security sector reform and published several articles on strategic airlift capacities, security sector reform, and civil military relations in Sub-Saharan Africa. And somehow, in addition to all of the above, he is a doctoral student in diplomacy and international relations at the Center for Diplomatic and Strategic Studies in Dakar. And finally, Dr. Yolan Fuka is an assistant professor in the Department of Political Studies at Queen's University. Her research and teaching focus on gender, African politics and security, political violence and research ethics in conflict affected societies. She holds a PhD in international relations from American University. Her current research is a historical and political analysis of female combatants in Southern Africa. In addition to her academic work, she has extensive experience with development and security research agencies and has worked with USAID, the UK Department for International Development, the United Nations, the African Union, the Center for Strategic and International Studies, the US Institute of Peace, and the Institute for Strict Security Studies. We are in illustrious virtual company, ladies and gentlemen. So we are here as the world is marking the 20th anniversary of the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325, which launched the Women's Security, Women, Peace and Security Agenda. And I would like to start our discussion, our questions with the ambassador, to, um, if I might. Ambassador, could you talk to us about how you see the involvement of women and the consideration of gender as critical to the advancement of security and the fulfillment of Agenda 2063 in Africa? And how do you think we're doing? Over to you, uh, Madam Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Shannon. Let me start uh, very quickly by uh, saying good morning to, to everyone, uh, particularly all the alumni uh, across, across uh, Africa and the world. And of course, to my um, co-panelists, it's really a pleasure to be uh, with you uh, here today. And I thank the Africa Center uh, for um, both inviting me and organizing uh, today's meeting, particularly on a very uh, pertinent uh, issue. As, as you've mentioned, uh, Shannon, we've just marked the 20th anniversary of UNSCR uh, 1325. Um, we uh, have uh, had a number of activities both here um, at the UN and, and, and across the world. And this also uh, marks a pivotal year uh, in Africa's agenda as it was declared the year for silence in the guns to create a conducive environment, uh, a conducive, conducive conditions for Africa's um, uh, development. And this is precisely the link uh, with um, uh, Agenda 2063. It, it, it resonates uh, with our efforts uh, to silence the guns in Africa by putting um, the issue of women, peace and security at the center of um, peace processes and the meaningful participation uh, of, of women, uh, as well as um, prevention of violence against women and girls uh, to protect, uh, protect their rights. Um, at the level of uh, the African Union, we have taken a number of concrete um, steps um, in terms of integrating the agenda into um, our uh, global priorities, which is Agenda 2063. Um, first of all, it's been included into some of our core um, instruments, uh, including the protocol to the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. Um, as well as the solemn declaration on gender um, gender equality, and you know across the board in within the um, AU peace and security um, architecture, um, and there are also a number of regional provisions um, at the level of the regional uh, economic um, communities. So, in terms of um, what we have done and and how we're doing to uh, respond to you um, uh, directly. Um, recently, um, we have um, developed a number of national action plans, uh, which have allowed us to incorporate some of the lessons learned uh, from the first generation national action, action plans. These um, include um, security sector ministries taking a leading role and kind of recognizing um, that there's a number of uh, responsibilities, including ensuring that we're um, uh, financing, um, uh, um, uh, allocating financing to, to some of these um, initiatives. 
But despite the existence of some of these uh, advanced uh, uh, instruments, of course, implementation um, remains, um, uh, we have quite a bit of work to do in terms of um, implementation. And of course, uh, as we know, um, um, in terms of some of the uh, 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 realities we've seen on the ground, there are um, still a number of gaps. That said, uh, however, um, I would like to mention um, more or probably hammer a little bit more on some of the um, successes in terms of what we've been able to um, uh, achieve, at least from the um, level of the AU with some concrete examples, uh, if you allow me. Um, first, in realizing some of these gaps, um, we've try to uh, step up our efforts to ensure that um, women are core partners um, in terms of um, uh, preparation, in terms of um, uh, participation, in terms of uh, mediation efforts. Uh, we've carried out a number of uh, solidarity missions, uh, for example, jointly uh, between the African Union and the UN. And we've kind of adopted this action-oriented approach. Uh, so ensure that um, at the highest level, you're visiting communities, you're listening to uh, the women who are at the uh, forefront, um, and you're bringing people uh, together um, to uh, discuss the realities, um, some of the realities on the ground. Um, these joint missions started uh, back in 2017, um, and they've shown clearly that the issue of violence against women um, continues, um, including um, the use of women and girls um, as, as suicide bombers, particularly in specific regions, um, and that female peacekeepers also require um, more gender, gender sensitive um, strategies in terms of in terms of deployment. So it's 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 kind of across across the board. Um, in terms of the protection pillar uh, specifically, uh, we've started implementing um, some of the um, WPS um, commitments, um, linking it obviously to the other um, pillars um, in addition to, um, as well as participation, which I, which I mentioned earlier. And we're trying to lead some of these um, efforts uh, through uh, launching um, what we call an action-oriented network of women in mediation, uh, uh, known uh, as, as FEMWISE. I, I know many of you are familiar with this. And we've also partnered with the UN under uh, the joint framework that we currently have in peace and security to ensure that women's leadership in peace and security and development is at the forefront. And we've set up this network called the African Women Leaders Network, which is all, has also been recognized by the UN um, Security Council Resolution 2457. Um, so maybe I'll stop there in terms of giving you some of the uh, some of the um, uh, um, examples of what we've done um, concretely and um, some of the successes. In terms of challenges, um, I would probably uh, mention uh, two uh, very briefly, and then maybe we can expand on them. The first one I would say, um, and this is this continues to be uh, the gap that we, you know, uh, con continuously highlight, which is the issue of um, inclusion. Um, in terms of policy, in terms of framework, we continue uh, to have um, uh, a lot of guiding policies that allow us to kind of uh, know what needs to be done and we all know what needs to be done. Um, but when you go uh, a little deeper um, into the field um, and speak particularly to people within the community, you tend to realize that they, this, this gap between policy and reality continues to, to exist. In terms of the issue of inclusion, for example, uh, we know that there is a growing acknowledgement um, that uh, exclusion drives uh, conflict. Um, but in terms of um, practical guidance about what meaningful inclusion means or how it looks like, uh, it continues to be 
you know a, a, a challenge on how how we can truly we can truly um, uh, achieve it. So I think we need to be able to build um, first of all uh, um, communities um, that are more inclusive. Um, we need to build security forces and institutions that address the varied interests uh, of uh, women and then you know brought more broadly um, in terms of our population. And I think true security um, also needs to be, in order for us to achieve true security, it also has to be um, uh, inclusive uh, security. So maybe I'll stop there and um, uh, come back to um, some other uh, points uh, later. Thank you. Thank you so much. That, that was a, a brilliant start to our conversation. Um, General Diop, um, I would like to turn to you now um particularly for your perspective as a military leader um, could you talk to us about what role gender has played in shaping peace and security outcomes in, in senegal and in the west african region and help us understand it from from your perspective as a, as a leader in national security and in the military particularly Je vous remercie. thank you very much Allow me to first of all, thank you for this invitation to be with you today. And I would say that we um, are participating, we're, I, I've been uh, able to take time away to participate in this webinar and my, uh, the authorities have allowed me to do this despite the fact that we have a lot of other duties and a heavy schedule, but that's because they understand the importance of this topic. And I've been uh, working with Africa Center. I've been aware of the ACSS for almost 20 years now. And of course, everything that I say today is just my personal opinion. This is not, uh, I'm not speaking in an official capacity. But before I answer your question, I'd like to first of all specify that when we take into account the gender issue, then this allows us to have greater harmony, the harmony that we all need in our societies, more harmony, more stability. And I say harmony because if we are really including gen the gender dimension, we are creating the conditions for equality between men and women. So we all have the same rights at the political level, social level, but also the economical level. And if we are really taking into account the gender dimension, this also allows us to create the conditions for equity so that we can make sure that women and men are not victims of discrimination simply because of their gender, whether because they're men or because they're women. So this is an aspect that is extremely important, but also if we really take into account the gender dimension, we can also promote the complementarity that we need so much in our society. And this allows us as a society to achieve much greater results. The results and the outcomes that we cannot achieve if it's only focused on men or only focused on women. So we need this basic complementarity. Having said that, uh, coming more specifically to your question, I am so pleased to see that in our subregion, in the ECOWAS region and the WEMU region, our authorities have understood all these different principles that I've just been mentioning. And as a result, we have been adopting policies that are focused on three elements. First of all, the protocol to the African Union Charter on People's Rights and on Women's Rights, and also the uh, Women, Peace and Security uh, Agenda, and then Agenda 2063. So we are adopting policies that are in line with these three strategic pillars. and 
than a lot of organizations in our subregion, and there are many of them. I can't cite them all because there are so many, but there are many that have been doing remarkable work integrating gender into all these activities and policies, which of course is helping to promote stability and security in our subregion. Among these re organizations, there's RIFPA, which is the network of women in the Mano uh, River Union. This organization has been contributing to resolving the crisis we've seen in Liberia and Sierra Leone. We can also uh, talk about the Security and Peace Network of women in the ECOWAS region. And this organization has done much uh, work in the field of preventing conflicts and there are, of course, a lot of uh, participants on this webinar today who could probably speak more about this than I could. But then there's also the West African Organization for Consolidation of Peace, WADEP, which has done a lot of work uh, to develop and implement the national action plans for uh, Resolution 1325 of the United Nations Security Council. So that's at the sub-regional level. Now in Senegal, our leaders have understood that we have to also integrate women into our security and defense forces, and that this is really uh, the only way that we can truly strengthen sec security in our country. So we uh, undertook an, uh, efforts and a decision was made uh, several years ago to integrate women into the security and defense forces, forces so women have access to basically every sector of the security and defense forces. And then a law was also adopted to promote what we call absolute parity between men and women in all uh, institutions, uh, whether they are totally par or partially elected institutions. And so this is allowing women to have greater access to decision-making uh, posts and positions and to be uh, more involved in decision-making and policy-making. We also uh, adopted a, a policy on gender equity, which enables women to uh, be fully integrated in the efforts uh, to promote sustainable development and to also add value to this uh, sustainable development efforts. And, and then in 2020, we also adopted a law that penalizes or criminalizes rape and pedophilia. And the fact that this law was adopted uh, shows that we are really making these efforts to ensure there are extra layers of protection for women and that there are many other efforts that have undertaken, other efforts uh, by other organizations such as uh, the women, uh, the Network of Women Solid Women Solidarity in Africa it has a very strong chapter here in Senegal. Also many efforts by the civil society, which is very involved in all these uh, efforts. And then, and I can come back to this later as well. Uh, we've also been focusing on uh, promoting women's leadership. And uh, my colleague Aydera, Dr. Aydera, who is a partner with West Africa, has been very involved in what we've been doing as well. And then more recently in our country and worldwide with the health crisis we're seeing with the COVID pandemic, integrating the gender dimension and involving women in the response to COVID at the national level has enabled us to have much greater results than what we might have had if we hadn't involved women so much. So that's uh, what I would say uh, uh, in response to the question that you asked me. And then of course, I would be happy to answer uh, other questions and give you some more specific examples to uh, of our, our experiences in Senegal. Thank you very much. General, thank you so much. And, and I think it's, it's terrific to, to end with that last um, very specific example about um, COVID-19 and how gender integration has, has um, 
strengthen that response. Dr. Puka, I would like to turn to you next as, as you bring us the perspective of the academic and would like to, to sort of pose a two-part question for you. One, could you walk us through the differences in thinking about gender versus thinking about, about women, peace and security, and, and just to help us um, unpack that, that a bit. And two, could you, you, you've done extensive research. Um, could you give us some, some top lines on what research and practice show you about the critical roles um, in the African security uh, landscape that women play, either as combatants or as peacemakers. So over to you, Doctor. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all the participants and my esteemed co-panelists. Thank you very much to the Africa Center for uh, hosting this event and for uh, inviting me. I, am, uh, I feel very privileged to be in this presence and to be engaging with you on this uh, important topic, which is uh, the crux of my uh, current research agenda and my engagement in policy over the past few years. Um, I think the main starting point when we're trying to disentangle this, um, the issue of gender, peace and security, and women in peace and security is a definitional issue. Um, and it's not very exciting, but I think we need to start from uh, a point where we understand the difference between uh, what we mean when we say gender integration and, and most importantly, gender mainstreaming, for instance, and the inclusion of women in institution. And when we talk about gender, we're talking about uh, the socially constructed system that creates hierarchy associated with masculine and feminine characteristics. So in non-academic talk, <laughs> um, it really means what are the norms and what are the behaviors and the expectations that are associated with being a girl or a woman on one hand, and what are the social norms and behaviors and roles that are usually associated with being a boy or being a man. And those traits are often, we talk about complementarity, which is true, but they are often defined in opposition to one another, yeah? Um, and there's an increasing amount of evidence, um, and particularly in scholarship, but also in, in, in feminist circles in Africa, that starts to disentangle this idea of sex being always um, in line with what gender is, yeah. And I think this is important to, to be comfortable with even in um, hard security settings. And then when we're talking about analyzing the role that gender plays in security, we're not only talking about um, the role that women can play. May I give you an example? When we are trying to understand the ways in which non-state armed groups recruit participants to join in illegal and violent or extremist activities, we have to understand the role that gender plays in framing recruitment strategies of non-state armed groups. So for instance, in a context where young men are expected to be providers for um, their families, where they're expected to have achieved particular milestone to achieve manhood. And in this context where it's increasingly impossible due to social economic constraints, we've seen the evidence of non-state armed groups and extremist groups playing on these narratives of manhood to be able to recruit young men among their ranks. Now, that does not mean that women don't have a role to play. Sometimes women play a role in consolidating or reaffirming some of these expectations and sometimes playing into these narratives in order to encourage young men to participate. Uh, there are also spaces where uh, women will find that they are able to to fit within those gender roles to assist non-state armed groups. So engaging in gender analysis of a security situation requires us to look not only at women, but also at men. And what are the set of expectations that are locally set in their settings that are linked to the recruitment, that are linked to the root causes of conflict. Now, 
when we talk about um, the inclusion of women, um, then we're, we are talking about really this Agenda 1325 and all the documents that have been developed since its establishment 20 years ago. And it's at every level of government, every level of security institution, we want to be able to see the integration, not only the inclusion, and I think there's a nuance between the two words. You can include women and simply stir within institution as they are, um, which is sometimes what a lot of institutions do when they're not really familiar with how to deal with gender equality in their, among their ranks. Um, but what is more um, successful, at least what the evidence demonstrates, is that integrating women requires us to really look at gender mainstreaming as uh, analyzing the ways in which, in which men and women are able to thrive within the institution in which they are included, requiring uh, analysis of what are the ways and the means necessary to promote equality between men and women. We understand that men and women have different needs, they have different living conditions, they have different circumstances, but they also have equal access according to most countries' laws, according to international norms and regulations. They also have equal access um, to the institution, to the services of their countries and the organizations that are meant to protect them. As such, integration calls for analysis and the implementations of policy that promote gender equality and uh, gender equity. So mainstreaming does not mean simply adding women. Mainstreaming does not mean simply mentioning men and women as in a symbolic way in documents. It does not only mean creating organizations of women, um, and it does not assume that women are a monolith. Women in societies like men in, in, in their respective societies are diverse based on class, based on where they live, are they urban, are they in rural settings, the levels of education, the language that they speak. Um, so I think this is really important because it, it, then it, it helps us go stepping away from um, some of the symbolic uh, activities that we engage in excuse me, engage in, in order to say, yes, we have including women, included women. Africa as a region has done very well in the past decade in developing key instruments to include women in various levels and, and, and aspects of government and society and development. I think it's very remarkable to say that even in terms of political representation, the African continent is well ahead uh, in many settings, not all, but in many settings than many other regions of the world. Now, how do we make that representation substantive meaning having an impact as opposed to simply being descriptive. Um, and we can talk a little bit about the barriers and the obstacles at, at a later point, but I think once we establish a framework in terms of identifying the difference between gender and simply women, because when we often in, enter this conversation, people say, well, yes, we've, we've addressed gender, we've included women. Um, then I think um, we are able to then disentangle what Ambassador rightfully mentioned, the differences or the challenges in terms of the policies and what are the actual realities on the ground. Thank you very much. And, and I think that's, a, that's the definitional questions are really important. And I also think that the fundamental points that, that all of you are making about the, the critical nature of this, that it, it's not merely that, that we should promote this because it, it is in statements and policy and it, it, uh, um, it is in fact of strategic importance. It's, it, it has impact. And I, I think, you know, the, um, as practitioners and, and scholars of these issues, that's particularly important. Um, if we could, I would like to, to think about, ask each of you to think about, we've talked about um, uh, gender integration and, and 
gender mainstreaming and, and Dr. Buka has talked about gender mainstreaming and, and, and that it means more than simply adding women to the picture, um, but there's a more complex function to that. I would like it uh, if each of you could speak to barriers to, to fuller integration and gender mainstreaming and what you see as the next steps to overcome them. Um, what is getting in the way and, and what, would, what do you see as, as you know, should happen next um, from your various perspectives? Um, so General, I would start with you for this round. Um, what do you see as the, the barriers to fuller integration and gender mainstreaming? And if you were in a room with, with colleagues who were skeptical about this and, and they doubted the idea of, of bringing women in and, and how would you help convince these skeptics? Thank you so much. The obstacles uh, to integration can uh, have, have different reasons. It can be linked to to the social constructs. It can be linked to the motives, uh, cultural motivations, cultural uh, customs. It's difficult sometimes to change these cultural um, views. It can take time. It can be connected to religious uh, aspects and beliefs. It can be also be for the, but for the military, for example, we are an institution that is known for its masculinity and its conservatism. And therefore that can create an obstacle to the integration, uh, gender integration and of women in particular here. And also sometimes it's the lack of interest of women in a particular institution. So depending on the country, the uh, obstacles and barriers can vary. It can be cultural. Often it's cultural. It's the, and culture, as you know, takes time to evolve and change. And if we must, if we wish to convince the skeptic, the, those who are skeptical, we have to understand why. Where is the skepticism coming from? They're not enemies to what we wish. They often have times have very objective rationale or reasons. So we have to listen to them. We have to understand why. Uh, why, where comes, wherefore comes from the skepticism. So we need to, what we use often, it's an instrument that we call an analysis of the stakeholders, stakeholders analysis. So to analyze the stakeholders, it allows you to have an idea of who is for your project and those who are against it and those who have no particular feelings, who are neutral. And once you have identified those who are for your project, you have to understand why they are for it. And these reasons will help you, will serve as arguments that you can use to convince those who are against it. And you can also um, uh, affect and change those who are neutral. But the process must be undertaken with much patience because these are mentalities that we are seeking to change. They're stereotypes. They are uh, uh, socially constructed realities that takes time to change these. <clears throat> so we have to, uh, we have to, it takes, a, a, there's a certain level of teaching and the experience of Senegal can, can be shared perhaps in this case. Once we decided on the a complete integration of gender, especially of women in the uh, armed and security forces, we had, we had to start with a lot of humility in putting, in, in reaching our hands out to civil society organizations that specialize in this issue. And for quite a time, we worked together to 
review all of the documents that were in place. And during this examination of the laws, we realized that oftentimes they were not sensitive to the question of gender. So then we changed the uh, laws and the uh, government forms. And we sought to harmonize these um, government laws or rules to have conformity amongst all of these <coughs> rules and regulations. And, and so we had to use a lot of uh, teaching. We called upon countries who have already worked on integration of gender of women before us, who had started before us. We invited <coughs> uh p feminists from the united states from gabon from mali from gambia who came for three days to share with us with their senegalese sisters different experiences that they had uh, known when their country was uh, seeking to integrate this gender issue and this allowed us to uh, gain much knowledge and lessons that were put together in a document and these lessons allowed us later to formulate a, sec a sectorial strategy on gender in Senegal which we found quite uh, usable and we continued with the development of this national strategy uh, for gender and we were able to use this to um, to speak to leaders and also make the uh, Senegalese society aware of this to be able to draw more women to our organization. And we were able to advocate with the government on this as well. And we were able to put uh, documents into place that will allow us to uh, uh, give capabilities to women and to men because the question of gender it's a science that we need to uh, master. And if we don't learn to control it, you have to take the time to study it, to study it, to understand all its aspects so you can develop what we call a binary capacity that will allow you each time you make a decision to take into account the uh, specific needs of women as well as men. And, the, and this is what we did to overcome the difficulties that we had during the integration of women into the armed forces. And thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jamerlin. We're get also getting a number of questions coming in on the chat line. So, so I will um, pose uh, the two quick ones uh, to, to the ambassador and Dr. Buka, and then I will we'll turn to the questions coming from the chat line. Um, Madam Ambassador, uh, you you spoke to this um, uh, briefly that that you know uh, there's recognition that exclusion drives conflict, but but sort of the implementation um, is, you know of that principle and and acting on that can be can be difficult. Could you speak to to some of the steps you see necessary to overcome some of these barriers or or, or obstacles? Um, over to you, please. Okay, thank you um, uh, once again, uh, Shannon. Um, it's, a, it's such a pertinent uh, question, you know, because I think very often in, in, in the work we do, we have this tendency to kind of, uh, uh, you know, tick the boxes and um, elab elaborate on what we continuously uh, declare. Um, but in reality, uh, when it comes to the gaps, we shy away from speaking honestly about uh, what we've truly been able to, to achieve uh, uh, on the ground. Um, I think I will build a little bit more on uh, what the general uh, just said, particularly um, in terms of uh, the attitudinal um, uh, obstacles. Um, that is definitely uh, one of the um, uh, barriers that we continue, uh, continue to face uh, across the board. 
Um, in addition to that, and I'm hoping maybe um, Dr. Yoland will be able to say a little bit more on this as, a, 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 as an um, a academic. Um, more and more, we tend to see, you know, despite the progress that we've uh, made, um, the lack of insufficient um, uh, data uh, and, and data analysis, uh, particularly in terms of um, uh, gender issues. And that is also kind of linked to um, the lack of sufficient technical expertise in gender. Uh, we have more and more um, specialized uh, individuals and, 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 and maybe uh, initiatives uh, that focus on this, but it continues to be a gap. And of course, this um, is linked to uh, very much to uh, how it translates in terms of um, what we can do in terms of um, uh, actions. Um, I think more and more we're seeing uh, more research uh, uh, in terms of uh, um, you know what what is uh, what is required. We're seeing more and more reliable um, uh, data, but the gaps continue to exist. But this leads, I think, to kind of insufficient um, mapping, if you like, of the needs um, in terms of planning, uh, in terms of budgeting. You know, we talk a lot about gender sensitive budgeting, uh, but in reality, the data allows us to uh, sufficiently plan and ensure that we're able to um, look at the uh, long term. Uh, uh, possibilities and 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 also ensure that we're we're not doing more harm right um, in terms of effectiveness in terms of um, our interventions um, across across the board and this goes beyond just the you know the classic peace and security but also you know other broader socio uh, economic uh, development um, uh, issues um, I think partly one of the um, things that we've managed to do in terms of uh, the examples that I gave earlier was working more and more with um, community level uh, women's groups and linking um, the findings more and more to um, our uh, policy work. And in, 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 in this aspect, I think if we're able to work more with um, kind of like the women-led uh, organizations, community level organizations, um, grassroots level organizations, and ensure that they have uh, the resources, um, uh, including um, the technical capacity to be able to work more closely uh, with member states and the various uh, institutions, uh, because they're the ones that are really um, in the field on the ground um, from day to day, uh, working with um, many, um, uh, victims, uh, survivors, but also just communities in terms of, you know, uh, prevention and being able to um, uh, develop as, 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 uh, as societies. Um, I would say, uh, in addition to that, uh, we would also uh, need to explore more and more, I think, the mechanisms that allow us to take more concrete steps in order for us to be able to um, provide the necessary support uh, that is needed. Um, in addition to um, the issue of uh, resources, um, as uh, once again, I'll uh, refer to uh, the comment that uh, Dr. Yalan made in terms of mainstreaming, but true mainstreaming, right? Um, uh, not just uh, uh, inclusion to say that we have X numbers, but being able to say um, concretely, they're part of um, the entire process and everything that um, that we're doing. So those would be my um, comments in terms of um, the barriers and maybe uh, some of the recommendations in terms of how we can address them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. Puka, could you give us um, uh, um, uh, maybe uh, your kind of top two recommendations or thinking about next steps to some of the barriers that have been raised or that you have seen in your own work? Well, I think um, one key element that we all need to recognize is as we're trying to um, 
I think, shift the direction of, of uh, gender equality in all of our societies. And I say that because there's often a tendency to assume uh, that gender equality discourses uh, emerge out of Western countries and that Western countries have achieved gender equality. And, and that couldn't be further than from the truth. In fact, if we look at history, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm an academic and I do a lot of history analysis, some of the earliest movement of women and women's mobilization originated from the African continent. All this to say that this takes time. Um, we need to recognize how much time that takes. Now, 20 years on, it's important to take, to take stock. Uh, 20 years from 1325, it's important to take stock, but it's also important to recognize how much time, for instance, in a military institution, it takes for a woman to enter the forces and work her way up through the ranks. If we have countries that are, have only recently welcomed women in their institutions, we can't expect them to skyrocket to the top in a matter of a few years. So I think time is, is, is an important um, companion to, to be cognizant of as we walk on this journey. That being said, um, once we acknowledge time, it doesn't mean that it has to take an eternity and we need to tackle some of these challenges head on. In my expertise, having worked with government, having worked with um, different uh, security institutions, um, one of the biggest challenges is how do we um, hold stakeholders accountable accountable once they've agreed on or signed on to gender equity initiatives. We have a lot of countries who've developed um, national action plans, but there's very, it's very difficult once that's accomplished <clears throat> to hold stakeholders accountable, to monitor progress, and to report on the implementation. One thing that gives me hope, for instance, while this is an, a real obstacle, is the fact that the African Union developed a continental result framework. And I, and I wish this particular document were more um, um, accessible or more visible um, to stakeholders who are trying to monitor this, this tool, this toolkit, which is available online. And maybe uh, Ambassador Mohammed can speak to us a little bit about this. Is, it's kind of a 41 point indicator um, result framework aim at assessing, okay, country X has developed a national action plan. How are they doing in their own, this is a government approved document. How are they doing to implement the own goals that they've set for themselves? What has baffled me time and time again is when I, I, I look at countries' national action plans or when I look at countries' constitutions or their own laws, and there is still resistance. And these documents are consensus build documents. Let's remember this. this is, national action plans are often developed with civil society organizations, women's groups, government stakeholders, and are agreed upon documents. And once they are established, then there's still resistance on the part of various sections of, of government to put them in place. And, and I'm not going to mention name, but you know, if your constitution says you need to have gender equality or you need to have a particular uh, percentage of women in parliament or in the military, then the resistant aspect needs to be set aside and the laws should be respected and implemented. So there's a question of commitment, but also a question of how do we hold our stakeholders accountable? I, I totally wholeheartedly agree with Ambassador Mohammed and General Diop when they're talking about the expertise when it comes to um, gender is sometimes lacking. So it's difficult to implement sound policies if the people who are developing these things um, are well-meaning, but don't always necessarily have the tools available to them to be able to make sound analysis. And this goes back to the knowledge gap that was mentioned by uh, Ambassador. 
it is difficult to develop appropriate policies if we do not know what the challenges are. And I'm going to frame this this way. If we are an institution, a business, and we're trying to improve the quality of work or the quality of the, the space where people are working of a particular group or demographic, we have to engage with this group and ask them, what exactly do you need? What exactly are the challenges? How many of you are currently working in this space? And it's been very difficult to get clear data from, and here I'm looking, I'm speaking specifically in terms of women in the security sector across African countries. Having clear data about the experiences of women who have now joined these institutions for various reasons, and I can understand this issue of, you know, national security, not wanting to necessarily open access to researchers like myself to poke in the Department of Defense and ask women, so how are you doing in your department? But internally, there requires a certain level of data collection in order to understand the context in which women are currently operating now that they are able to do so in order to develop further policies to level the playing field, but most importantly, create an environment in which women can also thrive. Now I'm gonna make a last point that I think is important to remember as African, and here I'm, I'm really speaking from the perspective of an African woman. When we're talking about culture, about the place of women in our traditions, I also think it's crucial for us to recognize the impact that colonization has had on what we perceive to be our culture and, our, and the gender roles that have been attributed to men and women. When colonizers arrived on the shores of Africa, they did not expect to see women fighters. They did not expect to see women who were producers of knowledge, producers of the economy. And many of these things change with colonization. There's a tremendous amount of scholarship that we need to, and, and this is how you change attitudes, is about women's roles in various political and economic and security sectors. It's also trying to remember and uh, extract the knowledge that we have about gender discourses and about the roles that women have used to play prior to colonization. The resistance that I often find with regards to attitude is this idea that culturally, this is not what African women have done in the past. Scholars like myself have time and time again found women in very prominent positions in various roles and they were not aberrations, meaning they were not exceptions but simply the few names that we have access to. So as Africans, we also need to engage in public education um, about our foremothers, about the roles they played in our societies prior to colonization. This, I think, is a way in which we can sensitize people, first, about the reality that women's inclusion is not something that is exported from elsewhere, but something that was inherently part of our heritage as well. And I think it will also enable uh, women who are currently working in these sectors to, to turn to models that are, that are important to have outside of these ideas of militaries modeled after um, Western institution, but those that are in, inherently um, African in their, in, their, in their ideals and in and, uh, and, and the ways in which um, equality used to par be part of, of many of our institutions that were much more consultative than they are at the moment. Thank you so much. Those are all, all extremely important um, perspectives. And I would note that, that we are talking about, about the women, peace, and security agenda in Africa. We could be talking about the obstacles to this in any single region or any country in the world. This is, this is a, a universal challenge, and, and we all have obstacles um, and all, all hopes. And I want to start by thanking our, our very distinguished panel uh, for a really outstanding discussion. I also want to thank everyone who posed questions or who attended today. 
We were not able to get to all of your questions, but I want to let you know that these are exactly the kind of topics we are going to be exploring in future webinars. Looking more deeply at peacekeeping, at some of these implementation issues, we would welcome the chance, chance to explore those more deeply, as well as issues about women and gender in combating violent extremism or in uh, combating sexual and gender-based violence. So these are all great questions. They are all incredibly important topics. We've just started this conversation today. Uh, we look forward very much to continuing it. Um, I also want to thank my colleagues at the Africa Center who have made this event possible, um, that all the technical work and everything that goes on behind the scenes to bring this to you. So once again, thank you. I wish everyone a good day. Um, again, appreciate our presenters sharing their time and wisdom with us and hope all of you will be well. Thank you and goodbye.